So I was watching this Sarah Zed video. There's this, there's this trend of YouTubers that I follow who do videos on things that I have no idea about, like deep dives into topics that like I'm not interested in, like weird fandom cultures and stuff that happened on Tumblr. I follow this girl called like Zizix or Z something who's like does stuff about dramas that went down on Tumblr and she documents them in like hour long videos. And I watch like stuff, you know, all these, I have a weird selection of people I watch, but one of the things that I noticed that's so fucking interesting, that's like pervasive in YouTuber culture is this weird etiquette this like fear-based constant preemptive apologizing. Have you noticed this? And then the, the, they're just constantly like disclaimers and qualifying like, well, I say this as a this, this, and that. And it's not even like being woke. It's, it's beyond that. It's almost like, it really is like an aristocratic etiquette of speech or like, like some sort of honor code of like, I show you, constant respect just please don't be offended but then it crosses over into this other crazy level where like have you ever watched commentary channels so many of those cody co you know uh gonzalez and drew and all those guys uh who's that guy i love leon lush they're bullies like we can admit that right we don't have to lie and pretend that just because they seem like nice guys we'd like in real life that what they're doing isn't bullying. A lot of the people they're making videos on are like very clearly mentally ill and yeah, sharky and weird and creepy, but they're still bullying them. And then they have this like weird, they have their own weird etiquette where they give this person's account and bully them for 20 minutes for money. They make fun of someone. They make the MST3K their life. Oh my God, I'm dating myself, MST3K. But they like mock people, right? And it's great. I watch it. I'm entertained by it. But then during it, they always do this fucking thing where they're like, and hey, I just want to say uh, no ill will and like don't bother this person. Don't harass this person. Don't do anything mean to them. And like it's all in love. And it's like, what? Have you seen the internet? Have you seen who you just showed this person i get comments on my random videos from insane people like you think your giant audience there aren't it isn't you know six percent insane people just maybe just maybe it's irresponsible of you to volunteer this person up as tribute like and it's hard for me because i watch it as entertainment right you know it's like in some ways it's like a reality show right? Where people on reality shows ultimately are subjecting themselves to trauma, to emotional trauma. You witness people on The Bachelor hurting each other and having a negative weird time on a beach and it's entertainment and that's okay. But it really, it takes it to this level where it's like, okay, if we're constantly apologizing as we tear something apart and we acknowledge that the people we're talking to will inevitably either be crazy or offended. Someone in the crowd is gonna be nuts or mad. And so there's no way around it, but now we increasingly in our language, in the communication of ideas have to say, and also I'm saying this as a person who has never actually experienced being in a jet ski accident. So my, I don't want to say, you know, I do want to say that I am, you know, I've have the privilege of never having been in a jet ski accident, getting hit in the crotch with a jet ski, like the guy in this video right here, dog, but it is tragic that this happened to him, but y'all look at him screaming in the video. Like, I don't know. It all just seems like bullshit to me. Anyway, the reason I'm doing this live stream is because uh, someone, I use this YouTube channel really weird. Like I'm not a YouTuber. You guys know that I'm never, this is never going to be my source of income. I'm certainly not an influencer with my brand. I, I am just a guy who has a YouTube channel and likes to make stuff for the YouTube channel and write stuff. So 
what's funny is that a lot of times comments I get on this YouTube channel, I go, if, if I pose a question, you know, I'm not like Ben Shapiro or like, you know, a, a David Packman or like a talking head who wants you to have a response to me. Usually if I pose a question, I'm actually asking, hey, what do you bunch of random people who have, maybe have the same taste as me think? Right? Because you're in my algorithm, you're in my bubble. You somehow you found me at some point in some weird way because I've never promoted myself. <laughs> I've just continued being weird. Um, but yeah, so what, what was interesting is someone commented. I, I had had this whole reckoning. I now do things where I'll post a video with a take and then someone will point something out to me and I go, oh yeah, that's true. And I'll just post another video and I don't even set up a mic or anything. Um, but basically, yeah, somehow I watched Chronicle and came here. Oh, yeah, Screen Junkies. Why, why was I on Screen Junkies? Why did they ever invite me on? I'm just like a random screenwriter who's nuts. So I got to be on a bunch of podcasts. And people were like, okay, sure. And then it was funny because people were like, he's on podcast because he's John Landis' son. It's like, What? Why would anyone invite John Landis' son on a podcast? And it's like, no, I was on podcast because I was like manic and nuts. And I would pitch movies all the time. And that led to you watching this. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm distracted. This is not a cigarette. I'm distracted, but stay with me, okay? Here's what, here's what I want to ask you guys about tonight. I was had this reckoning with Black Superman on my YouTube here, where I was like, hey, it's Val Zod, guys. Stop being racist. And everyone was like, it's not Val Zod. And I had read like one article where it was Val Zod. And then I Googled it and I was like, oh, oh. And so, but then I still kind of like Black Clark and I like don't care. And when I saw the comments there, someone was like, well, I'm black and... To me, that puts Clark Kent in blackface. And I was like, wow. But Clark Kent isn't real, though. Wait, am I arguing against an African-American person for Superman? And that got in my head where I was like... And it was something I profoundly disagreed with, but I couldn't deny that someone might hold that opinion. Um... So then I was in this spot where I, I kind of felt like, well, maybe they'll do a thing with Pattinson and Joaquin, right? That that would be cool. You saw me in that other video. I was way higher than I am now. My friend Kat had given me an edible drink, and I was face down on the beach. I was like Hunter S. Thompson and not glamorous, not glamorous, fun Hunter S. Thompson. The sad, the sad moments that weren't written about. Maybe leaving Las Vegas, but like more bloated than Nicolas Cage. No, I, wow, I'm all over the place. Hmm, I wonder if I should leave this up. <laughs> okay. So the person responded, another person, and they said, there will never be a cinematic universe. That's backwards thinking. And I realized... Yeah, that's true, because the era of the cinematic universe is over. It's over. I mean, like, movies come out at a rate that could be considered cinematic universes? Not really, because kind of like Kong, it kind of goes Godzilla, Skull Island, King of the Monsters, Godzilla versus Kong. They feel like sequels to each other in, in a meaningful way. And... That's sort of true of the Justice League movies with Aquaman and Wonder Woman. It never really felt like it was a cinematic universe. It just sort of felt like here's a da da here. Here's Wonder Woman's a good movie. Okay, like Wonder Woman 1984. Did you feel like you were in a cinematic universe or did you feel like you were in a weird sequel to Wonder Woman? Like, you see what I'm saying? And, and you know, Shazam, they didn't even try to like, get him in there 
And Suicide Squad, they like didn't even really try. They were like, yeah, I guess Jared Leto's maybe going to be kind of in the Batman vs. Superman movie. They didn't even really try. They had like a dead Robin and it was like so unclear what that meant. That's a Zack Snyder where it's like uh, a thing happened and if you read the deep lore, I'll do six movies from now. Just like weird. Zack Snyder's brain operates in like he's always thinking like you are going to sit and binge watch all the movies in a row that he's planning to make as a sequel to the one he's making now. And if you give him 10 movies, you will get a coherent, fully realized thing. But until then, Zack Snyder's always going to have a scene where there's a time loop or a robot zombie or an alien space baby or, God forbid, a dead Robin. But is the era of cinematic universes over? Right? Is is the era of cinematic universes dead? And I want to say this because people don't realize this. The era of cinematic universes is not the 2000s. It starts in the 50s with the Universal Monster movies. House of Dracula, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Uh, the fact that the Lon Chaney, the Wolfman, Larry Talbot, remembers stuff that happened to him in crossover movies when he shows up in later Wolfman movies. Like, come on, that's a cinematic universe. They did it. And that's because they were building off the model of serialization and film serials. They were going like, why can't we do like the prestige version of that? And then of course, who pulled that off better than anyone else next? Toho with Godzilla where they began to sort of fold in all their other properties until the point that a Godzilla movie could feature Amanda or King Kong or, you know, it was just fucking nuts. And movies that weren't even really tied into the Godzilla verse. Like what was Frank? There's one like Mecha King Kong versus Frankenstein where there's like a giant Frankenstein who fights like a mechanical King Kong. It's full acid. It's like I, when you watch these movies, these Godzilla movies, especially the really weird ones, you always wonder about the adults who stood on set <laughs> and they were all like probably very solemn, you know, Japanese men smoking cigarettes, very like serious. <laughs> and then the robotic King Kong <laughs> walks on and the very solemn Japanese director, you know, they were so, they were so professional because it was like a factory Toho of these monster movies. They were such professionals. You watch the makings of, they're always these guys who like really look like, they look like how you imagine the Imagineers look. Because the great thing about Walt Disney's Imagineers, like Ward Kimball, all those guys, is when you go back and you look at them, now people who are creative try to present themselves as creative. And they're like, oh, I'm going to be seen, so I'm going to be a creative guy. When you look at the Imagineers, my Fucking God. They just look like random 1930s, 40s guys. They just look like men. And like men. Like truly like capital M white men. The white men of the 1950s. You know, like the classic that guy standing around Walt Disney Uncle or Uncle Walt when he's being that. And they like are designing plans for like, oh, it's a small world after all these like solemn Stern men are like designing Disneyland and like this will be the most magical experience for the family <laughs> if they enter the park and they see the buildings all built all small. Because, you know, it started Disneyland like low key Walt Disney. Walt Disney's so cool. He's not an anti-Semite, by the way. He's not. Don't do that. Don't put that on Walt. Walt's a utopian. He's a very weird, flawed guy, but don't put the anti-Semite on him. Slow it down. Okay, wait, sorry. Oh, oh, I forgot that there's a chat. I asked you guys a question, and then I forgot that this is an interactive experience. And I thought, like, when I upload this later, oh, my goodness. Is this a bad look for me? I feel calm and confident, if I'm honest. Hey, Olivia, what's up? Uh, let me look. Yeah, I agree that DC just, DC didn't commit hard enough. It was interesting. It 
it's sort of uh, Mr. Right in American Ultra Share Universe. That's true. And they both, they also are in the Dirk Gently universe. Uh, you guys have, it's interesting. One of the things that's cool is that actually Mr. Right, American Ultra, and Dirk Gently all take place in the same universe. And Dirk Gently season two, like, hard confirms it with tiny production clues. <laughs> and no one ever noticed because, like, no one, not enough people watch Dirk season two, which is so good. Dirk two, oh, Dirk Gently's so good. I'm so proud of that show. Oh my God, guys, did you hear when I, about when I became conservative on the internet? I, uh, okay, so some of you guys, some of you guys don't know this. The main way I post these days is on my Instagram where I post way too much and I give like updates on the epic and all that. But oh my goodness, like a week ago, someone like took screenshots of my views that are, are like my take, my stupid, always stupid take videos. <laughs> And they uploaded them, but they recontextualized them as like to imply that I had become like a right wing talking head. Like, oh, what's become of Max Landis? He's he's anti woke now. He's like, uh, and he's like, they they use the one about white screenwriters in the N word, and I was like, come on, guys. And you know what they use? They use the one. Uh, the diversity excuse video where I say, hey, white screenwriters, stop saying you can't get hired because you're white. They use that as an example of me being right wing. I don't know. So like they must have like not watched any of the videos. And like they didn't know about the Kryptonian epic. They didn't know about Polybius. They didn't know about anything I'm doing. <laughs> they didn't even know I did. No one even watched that when I did acid in that UFO. That's like the most vulnerable I've ever been on camera. And I loved it because no one cared. And I kind of just felt like, wow, I sort of showed my ass on YouTube. I'm in a bathtub in that video, not giving a fuck. And people were just like, yeah, Cats was pretty bad. <laughs> A real life Brett Easton Ellis character. No, dude. I'm so, I'm so just nice. I was like a dick for a while because I had issues. These days I'm just like nice. I'm just like a guy who's I, it's so lame. <laughs> I just am like a guy. I tutor I tutor uh screenwriter. I tutor screenwriters. And I make fanfic for YouTube. And it's sick. And I might buy a house soon, which is fun. I keep intending to light this, and I don't think I have. Brett Easton Ellis asked me to go on his podcast a couple of times. But, you know, guys, now we're deep enough into the stream that if you're watching this, you're like, you're deep in. Yeah, my Lois is Asian. My Lois is half Japanese and half white. Um, well, she's, yeah. Um Wait, I fucked up my hair. No, so the Brett, the Brett Easton Ellis, the Brett Easton Ellis thing, I don't like want to go on podcasts. I don't want to put, I don't want to like promote myself that way. That's sort of not how I think about my life anymore. And these days I think like, you know, if you want to interact with my content, you can seek it out and it'll be, it'll always be available. There will always be more weird shit. I'll never stop making shit till I die. Like, ooh. Bro, I'm having heartburn. I'm going to, at CrossFit tomorrow, I'm going to fucking die, dude. Ugh. And I'm, it's bad, too, because I, like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, pussy out on it. Sorry if that offends you, if you are have a vagina or feel that the connotation is uh, negative. But I don't want to, I don't want to fail at CrossFit. I want to. Have a have a classically masculine experience uh, in which I lift heavy things and you know feel strong. Deputy Andy, what's your problem with me? Why are you watching me if you don't like me? For real, I've never understood this. I've had people hate me since long before many people hate me. 
like a few people always hated me online. They always did. And I've never understood it. I've ne I understand disliking and arrogant, obnoxious, outspoken, arguable product of nepotism, but like, uh, yeah, but if you watch my comment, you know, my content, I'm not him. I'm just like an idiot. So like, you have to seek me out uh, to dislike me. But I've, I've never understood that because I've never done that. That's so like alien to me, the idea that I would go to try to talk to like a celebrity I didn't like. That's so like weird. Like who would do that? Like if that's the thing that like baffles me is when people, when pe whenever someone approaches me online in like a moralistic way, like saying like you're bad, you know, or, or, or attacks me from that angle. It's always like, Oh, creepy. Don't you understand that even by having this interaction with me, you're creepy. Like you're a weird stranger. And like, and that's always been true for trolls, but then people also like people, you know, with the twilight zone accident, people make twilight zone accident jokes to me as like punishment in theory, in their insane brain. And it's, but it's like, no, that's a horrific tragedy. Making a joke about that is incredibly sick and weird. I, I wasn't born yet when that happened. You're talking about a tragedy in which three people died to someone who wasn't there and you're making a joke about it? Like, you're in the moral high ground? I never understood that. I, I mean, I bored of the MG, MCU. Jupiter's Legacy? Um, well, Deputy Andy, I'm glad you're watching me and boosting my algorithm and being here and giving me your attention. I actually do appreciate that. Um, oh, wow, you guys are all talking. Sorry, I, I'm just like rambling, man. I, I would, again, I would tell you guys what I had for the rest of Dirt Gently, but I wouldn't want to go into too much detail because it would involve, you know, I would feel bad doing it without Rob and Arvind, uh, honestly. Um, and Arvind knows a little of what happens and what I, what I wanted to do. Um, and Rob does too, but like, you know, I, Dirk Gently is such a team effort. I wouldn't have been able to do that alone. Did you see me him her? Like I wasn't ready to coordinate something that big. And the fact that I was able to go so insane with the plot, especially in season one, season two is more straightforward, but in season one, that mystery is like nuts. And the fact that Rob and everyone involved in it protected me and like helped me and protected me from notes and like, made sure that I was like able to execute this crazy story. It was so wonderful that, I mean, I can tell you guys, like, I feel like they wouldn't be mad. Bright sequel. Oh gosh. You know, people, it's funny. People talk a lot about like bright is my star Wars when I said that. And you know what? I meant it. I didn't mean like, Bright was going to be as good as Star Wars. I meant that it was a super content rich IP where like I could maybe have created something that, that would blow out into a bunch of movies and a bunch of other writers could like work in this world. And, you know, I had fantasies of like Grant Morrison and people like that getting to, you know, sort of go nuts in a modern fantasy universe because, you know, if you've read the script for Bright, the script of Bright and the movie Bright are, are significantly different. Um, and, and, you know, that was that was a quality of, of the system at Netflix where really Will and David were given complete control over the movie. And I was on season two of Dirk, so I wasn't there to, like, be like, hey, but I also had no control of anything. Like, David... If you've seen David Ayer, David Ayer does not, if he's not interested, he's not interested in speaking to you. You know, he's a tough guy. He's not, a, I'm a, like a dork. And like, I'm notoriously kind of easy to work with, which is funny because like, I'm not notoriously easy to work with. That's an over-exaggeration. But I was known as being like a fast writer. 
But, you know, David had no patience for that. And he had his own ideas of what he wanted to do with the movie. The script, the movie Bright, it really feels like it's about race in a kind of strange way. And the script for Bright is about trust and class, kind of, but not really race. It's about class. And it, there are all sorts of little changes that what well, that's what's frustrating is watching bright for me there's all sorts of little changes that change it and make it you know free of a commentary on the quality of that film make it not what i intended like for instance jacoby is one of he's an orc cop but he's been an orc cop for a while there are other orc cops he is one of the first orc cops or the only orc cop in his district. But there are districts with lots of orc cops because in the script for Bright, you know, there was all this world building stuff David cut out, but like something like 3%, no, 10% of the global, po no, that's wrong. 10% of the global population is non-human. And then that's divvied up between mainly orcs. It's like, four or 5% orcs and then tiny divisions of everyone else. And so it, it's meant the idea of the way that orcs were represented in the script is not as urban people. They're, they're meant to be a stigmatized class in the same way that, you know, a religious person or someone with an outward sign of a culture or, you know, someone who wears a, uh, you know, a turban or a, or a bindi or, or any of that. That's what it was meant to be. It's the inside outsider, the Jews, kind of, you know, like people who they're like us, but they're enough not like us that I don't trust them. And that's what the orcs were meant to re represent in the script for Bright. In the movie, they're more like, yo, yo. I don't know, but <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I wrote a Chronicle sequel called Martyr, which, uh, which featured an actor named Miranda, who I really enjoyed. The Chronicle sequel uh, is about the people who edited Chronicle because Chronicle, the found footage document appears is the first shot of Chronicle 2 is someone editing Chronicle 1. And it's the story of the world's first super villain. And it was cool. It was, it was a very different tone. And at that point, Josh, I think Josh in his mind, he was already like on to like big director time mode. And I was like, come do Chronicle with me. Let's be dumb together. And I think Josh, you know, they were, they'd offered him Fantastic Four and they, you know, with Chronicle, they, they that was lightning in a bottle. Like the, they would have never greenlit that movie. That was like a magical moment in time. And it wasn't because I was John Landis's kid and it wasn't because anything. It was just because that script and my attitude and my agent's attitude and my man, really my manager's attitude and Josh's attitude all just aligned in this cool way. And we got very lucky where we got these producers who John Davis is, you know, he's a machine producer. He's an, uh, he's an industry stalwart. So he just chugged that movie right through. But then the, the exec we got was this guy named Steve Asbell, who, you know, he's a big film fan and you're a nerd. And we kind of got lucky with him too. And then we just got lucky in the green light. We couldn't believe it. And, and I refused to sell it without Josh attached to it, which everyone said was crazy because Josh had never even directed like a movie ever. He directed a web series. And I was like selling a bunch of scripts at the time. And I just used all the momentum I could just like, here's Chronicle. This is the one. And I'd actually already sold Mr. Right, which is weird because that didn't get made for like four years. And like, Wow, what a strange time to like look back on in my life because I was so young too. And I had no understanding of how special what was happening to me was. If you look at videos and interviews with me from that time, oh my 
God, I'm so up my own ass because I have no perspective on how difficult screenwriting is, what a difficult game it is, how hard it is to break through, how, you know, and, and I'm so up my own ass and so busy going, it's not because I'm John Landis's kid that I, I can't recognize that I'm achieving something special and that something special is happening. And like, I, it kills me because now I look back at that time, you know, there's lots of stuff. I, I have lots of regrets in my life, but at that time in my life, specifically in my career, I could have done so much more than I did if I had just gotten out of my own way. It's, it's like, it's nuts. And it was funny too, because the biggest, the biggest disillusioning thing for me in my whole career was having all this momentum as a screenwriter and being able to sell my original ideas but all the things I really wanted, I have lots of original ideas. I had an idea that I, I've been thinking about for months where I think I pitched it on here one time where I pitched a Western vampire thing. I also want to do caveman vampire thing. And I also had an idea about a, a serial killer who targets dogs and also a 911 call from the past that keeps coming in to a 911 station, except things you do on the 911 call can have butterfly effects into the present in the 911 station and things go more and more nuts. I'm writing that one with my friend, Juliana. I'm also writing Hellbound, the fucking crazy thing. But the, uh, to go back, that was what I wanted. I wanted Hellbound. I wanted Superman. I wanted to write a Spider-Man movie. And it was frustrating because I wasn't that type of writer. The guys who were getting hired to write those things were like trusted industry hands. They were taking like risks on directors, but those things were so produced. The Marvel movies are all written by committee. And there's like, you know, that guy, they're, they're all like top down. It's like a TV show. It's like a brilliantly run TV show. And I would just realizing like my whole life, I've loved all this comic book shit. It's all right in front of me and I can't touch any of it because if I, I'd be a writer for hire. And so I, I think other than Victor Frankenstein, I have seven movies and they're all originals. That's cool. I never, that makes me happy. And then I finally, it was cool though, because I finally, I got to do American Alien and I got to do Dirk. Sorry, I'm like realizing now. I got the two properties I really wanted, Superman and Dirk Gently. Oh, well, I guess my entertainment career as an artist is complete. I I didn't notice. I didn't notice. <laughs> Nailed it. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry, I'm just reading all this. Wait, elevator pitch? Say that again? Deputy Andy, that's a great pitch for like a schmucky troll. Great idea. Deputy Andy, the, the little bitch, asshole, idiot, little fucker, little bitch, little bitch, no dick. This guy, he, <laughs> he has a great idea for a movie, uh, which is you do uh, you do Hammer Horror, but James Bond. I mean, like, I would have loved that if they had made it at the time, right? Like, how good would have that have been? Imagine Christopher Lee as Dracula or, or like Vincent Price. Is Vincent Price in? Christopher Lee is the man with the golden gun, right? Is Vincent Price in a James Bond movie? WWE releases thoughts. Oh my God. Do I see a path going forward to get back to where I was in screenwriting? No, Hollywood doesn't even exist that way anymore. I see a path going to wherever I need to go to feel happy because I'm feeling pretty happy about the Superman thing and the Golden Goblin and I'm chilling. I, I'm in no rush to, I'm in no rush to, to get back to an industry that I mean, no longer even it is a content industry there's no industry to go back to. That's what my cat's video is about. And then I'm right. Like it's my cat's video is insane because like now the arc lights close. Now all these theater chains are closing and it's just like happening, but no one cares about my cat's video because it's so dumb. <laughs> you see this guy's making a twilight zone accident joke in the, uh, in the chat. 
it's weird to watch them, right? It's like, oh, this guy's life is like weird and sad. And sometimes I go to their pages and like I'll I'll be like, who's this troll who's like making a joke about the tragic death of children? And I'll go to their pages and it's always like, I'm here with my wife. I'm white. I like I'm with my wife and my dog. Oh, I'm a nice guy. Oh, I love Captain America. Look at me in my one red letter media. And it's like, oh, yuck. Oh, weird, gross. Ew, I saw into your brain, dude. I see the face you put out here on your fucking Instagram where you're Mr. Nice Guy. But in my DMs, you're a psychopath. <laughs> Would I ever write a book on screenwriting? I don't know. Yeah, Near Dark is a vampire western, but it's really more of a vampire western noir in sort of the tradition of like a blood simple or something. You know, the, the sort of like dirty out in the desert, but like modern day, but trucks, but strippers, but meth, you know, that thing. It's Breaking Bad. Near Dark plus Breaking Bad equals money, 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 baby. Where's that show? Where's the vampire drug dealer show? That actually is a good idea for a show now that I'm like thinking about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel incredibly lucky. My favorite Batman run is from like 1994 to the end of Batman International. So till like the new 52 reboot. So like from 1994 to like 2009, I don't know. Like I really loved one of my favorite characters ever is Nightwing. And I've talking, talk, talking, I've spoken often about how much I love Dick Grayson and, and how interesting I think the character is and how much narrative potential he has and how he's, I, I've said it more articulately than I ever possibly could now. But basically what I'm saying is Nightwing fucking rocks. And I fucking love that Israel fucking get, has to fight Nightwing. And I love when Nightwing tries, to, when Dick tries to be Batman and then lets Israel take over and then no man's land and Dick gets pulled back into the fold and the, the Bat family first shows up, this dumb thing that's been turned into like t-shirts and fetishized of this clearly dis dysfunctional nuts family. And now it's like all these like fan art on Instagram of like all the Robins hugging each other. I'm like, Oh, where, how did I get on this hashtag? But the, <laughs> the, the thing is I loved watching Dick Grayson be pulled back into the Batman fold. And then the, all the stuff in Bloodhaven, And I loved how that eventually crossed over with, Detective Comics, and then, of course, into Bruce Wayne Murderer, possibly one of my favorite one-shot comics of all time. I It rocked my socks off, not since the end of The Trial of Gambit had my socks been so thoroughly rocked off of my little comic book reading feet. I had yet to pick up an issue of Preacher, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, that kicked my ass, Bruce Wayne murderer. And I loved Bruce Wayne fugitive. And the fight between Dick and Bruce that caps off, sort of kicks off Bruce Wayne fugitive is the basis canonically of my version of Batman, including an incredible line where Batman says, there is no Bruce Wayne. And I thought that was one of the bravest, most heartbreaking things I'd ever read. Because of course there's a Bruce Wayne. He raised this kid. He loves Alfred. He's like a real guy. He's just this sick. He's this mentally ill that he thinks he's Batman. And I went, oh, that's a better idea for the character than just he's pretending. <laughs> oh man, I'm kind of tired, guys. Oh, gosh. Let me read this. Yeah, I did notice... Uh, I did notice that the new cartoon seems to reference American Alien. Um, And that's fine. You know, it didn't bother me when the Superman Man of Tomorrow that, like, 
ripped off American Alien, but like did it without being American Alien. It's like, hey, here's a, but it's a humanist story about experiences in a young man's life that lead him to want to be a better person. And DC was like, fight robot. I don't know. So like, it's, it, it, I don't mind it. I'm honored. I'm honored that they do this shit. You know, like that's my shit. I invented that Superman with the goggles and the bulletproof vest. That's my shit, dude. And it's in a Superman thing, just like I always wanted when I was a little kid. I used to watch the fucking, when the 90s animated Superman cartoon came out, I was like, now this is the fucking G, because the Batman cartoon had been on, and something about Batman, I love him, it's sinister to me. It's sinister to me, just, it's it's weird that he does this. And any version of Batman that doesn't address a little how weird it is like that's what killed me about dark knight rises was it was like being batman was treated like a knighthood like it was like he was like and i put down the mantle of batman and i and it was like what the fuck dude it's a bat mask you put on a halloween mask and then you beat the fuck out of people acknowledge that that's yeah, you, you, now you're in a pit in like Tibet or something. Okay, but acknowledge that you got there because you made the conscious decision to make a bat themed armor and begin attacking people. Like anything, that's what I loved about Michael Keaton's Batman. Is he seemed a little nuts? He seemed like he's a little bit off. Like Michelle Pfeiffer comes down with her borderline personality disorder ass coming up in, on him. Like, well, I say this as someone with my own experiences with borderline personality disorder, I'm sorry if anyone is offended, but like Batman's kind of a fucked up guy. The shit he has with Catwoman's kind of fucked up. That's what makes the shit with fucking Peter Parker and Felicia Hardy so hot and different from Bruce and Selena are two like broken people who are attracted to the darkest parts of each other. Sick hero villain dynamic and then sick thing to eventually evolve into a real couple. Felicia Hardy and Peter Parker are two scoundrels who like to fuck. And Peter is a guy who really likes the idea of having a hot girlfriend, as evidenced by who he dates. How many women has Peter been interested in? Huh, it seems like he focuses on tens like... Peter, come on. And it's like, oh, my rich friend. Come on, Peter, you little social climber. I see you, Peter. You want to be famous, professional wrestler. You guys ever notice this about Peter Parker? Sorry, this is Herman talking now. The shocker's coming, coming out now. You ever notice how full of shit Peter Parker is? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll avenge my Uncle Ben by doing good things in a bright red and blue costume in a way that everyone can see. I have a symbol. <laughs> Hi, look at me. I'm not a nerd anymore, Peter. Come on. Come on. Oh, I don't have any friends except for the son of a billionaire. Come on, man. Like you, Peter, you scoundrel. You're a piece of shit. <laughs> we know Peter Parker's a piece of shit. You imagine, imagine getting your arm broken by a super strong guy. Because you were stealing a bike. Like, and then he makes a joke. Like, oh, you'd hate him for the rest of your life. Is this interesting or do I seem insane? I'm just, I'm just talking. This is me demoing what my podcast would be. You know, this is me trying it out. This is me just letting it out. Olivia, are you being serious? Because I'll delete this right now. Hmm. Hmm. Does Aben Sur show up again in the Kryptonian epic? Why, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yeah, of course I know about Phoenix Jones. Oof. Yeah, getting hit in the face with a manhole cover. Like, fuck. Like, 
there was this whole thing in the Kryptonian epic that I cut out because it was too long. <laughs> it was so crazy, though. I'll tell you it. It was there was this guy. It was one of those one pager stories I wanted to do, but it was about a guy who gets out of jail and goes into Gotham. And when he goes into Gotham, he finds out he has a son. So he moves in with this woman, but she's an alcoholic and they hooked up when they were teenagers and they hate each other. And every night they fight and every night they scream and fight. And it gets to the point where they, they fight and scream all night. And the boy, the little boy they have hates them more and more and more. So the dad doesn't know how he's going to get money for the boy. So he falls back in with these criminals who used to work, he used to work with. And they, they say they have like very easy thing. He just needs to drive them to a place. There's no guns or drugs or anything. It's just a meeting where they're going to talk about something in person that they can't talk about online. So he arrives at this place. When he arrives at this place already, something's weird. The other car is a Cadillac with like big Cruella de Vil Fendi's on it, like real weird. And a guy gets out of it holding an umbrella. And the guy is like short and fat and weird and wearing like a suit. <laughs> that guy goes with guys with machine guns. So now this guy is like, I was told there would be no guns. I want to leave. They go into a building. This guy's left sitting in the car and he gets more and more nervous about being in the car. So he picks up a gun from the seat and he gets out of the car. And as he gets out of the car, something touches him here and he's pulled 70 feet into the air, up into the fucking rafters above the docks where they're meeting. And something grabs him and turns him and he falls about 70 feet back down and then he's caught by his leg. And when he's caught by his leg, dislocates his hip, but he's left dangling. And he's left dangling there screaming in pain because it dislocates his hip. But before he can even scream, before he can even release air, something hits his mouth like that. And he sees this oily black shape just drop into the warehouse. Then he hears screaming and gunfire. Eventually, the pain and the fact that he's upside down, he's starting to pass out, he's getting woozy. He feels his cell phone ringing. His wife's calling him again and again. Where are you? Hours pass. No one comes out of the warehouse. He sees GCPD roll up. He has to hang there as they send guys up to cut him down. Four and a half hours. His hip has permanent nerve damage. Guess what? Your insurance doesn't cover shit, but they don't even arrest him. They don't even fucking arrest him. Because they can't even prove that he did anything. He doesn't even have a gun. So they fucking let him walk because Gotham's infrastructure is falling apart. So they let him walk out to the fucking street. Meanwhile, this thing from the fucking warehouse gets taken out in a straight jacket. This little fat guy, like he's crazy. He's taken out in like fancy cars. Everybody else goes home in ambulances or fucking paddy wagons. So what, this fucking weird criminal got treated like a celebrity and now he can't walk? Days pass. He can't get a job. The pain in his hip is getting worse and worse. He can barely walk. How, the, how can he get afford insurance on this? Impossible. Impossible. He's an ex-con for fuck's sake. He can't get a loan. He has no living family. The wife's getting worse. Now she's not coming home. He doesn't know where she's going. He, she says it's with this other woman and they're like going to start a business. He doesn't care anymore. He doesn't speak to her. The son doesn't speak to him. Years pass. He sees Superman on TV in Hawaii fighting robots. Feels like it might as well be a movie. It might as well not be happening because for him, his life is not in the TV. It's not in the internet. It's in his hip. He can't walk. It's in his son who doesn't speak to him. It's in the nightmares he has about being yanked up into the air as he was trying to leave. It's that little fat thing that went in the building. What was that oily black shape? Was that a person? Was it that thing, the Batman? Is that what the Batman is? Some kind of thing that plucks you from nowhere, hurts you, and then leaves you behind? No. No, that can't be what Batman is. People like Batman now. And then the quake comes. His place goes down. He's homeless. And that night, he sees Superman flying over Gotham 
And where's Superman flying? After the Joker's on TV killing another superhero, Willamette doesn't care. He wants Superman to land, but why is Superman flying to Wayne Manor? That night, Willamette, with about 700 other people from Gotham, is on Easter Bridge when it fucking collapses. He survives. Easter Bridge only went like 10 feet, but it destroyed all the cars. His car's gone. Can't find his son. He's standing outside of the city. He's staring at Gotham. The fucking bat symbol turns on. So it's just like a vision into the life of someone who's affected by Batman. Uh, and that that's sort of the idea. That's the that's sort of the it doesn't have like a big decrescendo ending. The whole point is like. Life goes on for normal people who are affected by superheroes. That's what the Kryptonian epic is about. It's about the idea that superheroes secretly are normal people and their lives go on. And it's not just an endless series of serialized stories and narratives in which they have ever furthermore adventures with higher and higher stakes and more and more versions and a billion different Robins and a billion different Superboy men billion prime super dimensions it's it can just be a fucking story about people and not in the watchman way where it's a story about people who are superheroes this is a story about people who become superheroes for a brief period in their life that the kryptonian epic the superman part you'll see is like it's so nuts guys it's nuts. It's a. I, I still can't. I was watching the fucking Death of Batman thing today. I have no idea if it's good. Like, I, I feel indulgent even doing this. And this is what I would be doing on my podcast. And they say I should do a podcast, right? A Todd Phillips Catwoman set in 1992. Deputy Andy. Is that Andy Senor? Andy, are you trolling me? Because that's your second really good idea for a movie. The scumbag who's trolling me. Sick movie ideas. I'm about to glass planet off in this bitch. But I, I would never glass planet without my white shirt on and without my hair done. So this is not on brand. And this is not on brand. A contained version of a Marvelized DC universe. That is kind of what it is. But what it really is, it's really more like, and I've said this a hundred times, if the DC universe was Lord of the Rings. Or, no, that's wrong. If the DC universe was Game of Thrones and the story started in High Valeria, because my story starts on Krypton uh, with, a, with an engineer who has a brilliant... Is, is a brilliant brainwave and it leads to <laughs> thousands of years of chaos and uh, Clark Kent's role in it. He's like Jon Snow kind of he's or Harry Potter. He's one of those, uh, except I really wanted to do, I really wanted to do it justice about it being about superheroes because I hate things that are like, I hate things that pretend they're better than superheroes. I hate any time like the, the comic book, the boys and the first season of the TV show, the boys I don't like, and that's no great slam on them. They're both good, but I, I it just from a personal standpoint, I don't like the attitude. I don't like, superheroes <laughs> like it's just like okay sure like a superhero gets high or gets a blowjob can't you write that in a normal superhero comic like and that's kind of what invincible became was superheroes but and that's kind of the wonderful thing about the invincible comic and what's funny is the thing i like least about the invincible brand is the Omni-Man killing the fake Justice League? Because they are the fake Justice League. And to me, that's cheating. You can't, that's cheating. 
I don't care about those characters. The subversion is just that you killed them. And like cool, cool Drew Barrymore scream move kind of. And like, wow, people who haven't seen evil Superman shit and like, don't know that that's like Superman killing the justice league is like Superman's bread and butter. I always love that. I always love when people are like, what if this character turned evil? And if you're a comic book fan, you're like, that character has been evil 7,000 times. Wow, there's lots of people who like, yeah, I've just been holding the joint the whole night and I never lit it. Does this feel clinical? Does this feel clinical or are we having fun? Everybody's saying light the joint. I might go to bed. I, I wrote a bit. Dude, Hellbound's nuts. Uh, like, <laughs> I'm going to read you guys. Here, this will be cringe. We'll end it on some cringe, okay? We'll end it on a little bit of cringe. A little bit of Max acting as the characters um, in Hellbound. Uh, so here's a good one. Here's a good little moment. This is Sandy, a counselor at Camp Crystal Lake. Oh, that's one of our campers, Jason. He's out there visiting his mother. It looks like he's drowning. Yeah, he was a little boy who drowned here at this camp, and then his mother came back and murdered some of the counselors, including me. They killed her, but her vengeance lived on as a curse, I guess. So he's trapped in a loop here with her, unliving and undying. And then whenever he reemerges in the mortal world, he kills to stop the pain. Kills and kills, but the pain never stops. And when he's destroyed, he's sent back here to drown again. I think he'll be visiting his mother forever and ever at the bottom of that lake. Do you smoke weed? <laughs> That's at Camp Crystal Lake in hell. That's setting up Jason. Pretty fun. Uh... Here, wait, let's, you guys want another Hellbound section? Uh, the movie poster for Hellbound, the one that I always wanted, is Clive sitting on like a throne of human skulls and bones that if you look closely on the poster are skulls and bones of classic horror characters. And then he's sitting on a throne wearing like a red robe. It's not an image that actually appears in the movie. It's just a sick poster. And he has uh, like a crown on, the, on his head like that sideways. And it's got like barbed wire and spikes, like really hot topic bullshit, like mega death. And like, and then uh, Chucky is sitting on his lap and uh, facing the body is facing Clyde, but the head is on backwards and Chucky is like kind of looking like over like something's here. And then Freddy is next to the throne, like, you know, like the whisperer type character, like, and he's next to him and he has the claws and he's like whispering in something in Clive's ear. And then uh, Jason is standing behind the throne, like huge, like the mountain or the hound. And it's like a classical, sick fantasy image, but with these four characters. And then it's all white, except for the floor is all red. So it's almost like the throne room from uh, the last Skywalker. Was, was that what it was called? I don't remember. Except the floor is all blood. And the walls behind are white. So there's a splatter tracking up the wall in the shape of the lament configuration from Hellraiser. And then that shape spreads up further up the poster into all the different spirits and evil demons of horror monsters from the 20th century. And, uh, and the, in the words scrolling in the blood have been scratched in, it says, burn down hell. <laughs> Boom. Uh, I, uh, 40K games? I don't know. Um, I never finished the script for fin Quintessence because it got too complicated and it, I got overwhelmed. Yeah, I would want it to be like a mural. I would want it to be like a classic 80s 
epic fantasy movie poster a la Star Wars. That's what I'm describing. Like, I, because it's a fantasy film and it's way too long. I'm writing the script, it's gonna be like 148 pages. Let me give you some writing advice. 148 pages is, I would describe it as much too long. Um, but, and then I'm just going to upload it online and I'll answer questions about it. I hope people do art. Um, what did Loki say? I'm going to hop off in a second, guys. I did like the poster question. Mary Sue, the death of a franchise. <laughs> She's not a Mary Sue in that one. Dude, okay, so here's the problem. This will be a great way to end for the evening. The problem is... In The Force Awakens, I was like, I feel like this movie... My complaints about The Force Awakens were... I feel like this movie has a Mary Sue. And also, it's weird that the first ever black Star Wars stormtrooper is a janitor. Like it felt like he didn't really have a purpose in the movie and he kind of felt useless. Like he didn't go anywhere. Right. So the last, the last Jedi comes out. That's what it was called. The last Jedi. And I saw it and I like, it's nuts. It It's like the part where like, Finn like tries to sacrifice himself and then the girl like almost kills him by driving the thing into it. Then she's like, I love you. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, but Ray's not a Mary Sue in that movie. She's not. And the problems of the last Skywalker or the last Jedi are like way different than the problems of the force awakens. And then Rise of the Skywalker comes out and she's a fucking Mary Sue. And everything I said was right. And now everyone's allowed to finally be mad. And it was weird because I, most of my takes are bad. And later in my life when I like grow and mature, I look back at my old takes, me simping on Red Letter Media just because I love those guys so much. Uh, just I look back and I go like, ooh, uh, now that with more life experience, I think differently on things. And, and it's interesting. When people tell you you're young or you're immature, they often don't mean you're stupid. And it sounds like you're stupid. What they mean is you will think differently on the way you feel now, years from now, looking back. And they're often right in my experience. But the Mary Sue thing, <laughs> yeah, kind of weird, right? I'm stronger than all of this. Uh, I think I think the the one I regret the most because I said it wrong in terms of like opinions on movies and shit is uh is probably the worst take i had was involving myself in the ghost in the shell thing because that was the stupidest film controversy of all time and i didn't have that smart of a take and a pretty smart youtuber guy responded to me and I thought he was really right about everything he said. And <laughs> albeit he thought he was, he thought the things he was saying and the things I was saying were mutually exclusive and he was wrong. And he was also one of those guys who at first they seemed like really receptive and like not like an insecure troll. But then you talk to them a little and you're like, oh, you're kind of getting mad at me, even though I'm not being mean to you. And that's always whenever you're just trying to be nice to someone and trying to engage with them. And they're being aggressive and calling you names. It's always like, would you do this in real life? I'm tall. Like, would you really scream at me in real life? The people who've screamed at me in real life like that are always weird, crazy people. So like, 
the fact that like people would get in fights over my film takes was already weird, right? The space heist. No, the problem is is that I is that I the the big problem with me these days is I'm just making stuff. I'm not really writing scripts. I wrote four scripts last year and I'm playing with scripts. I like, I open them up and I do a little round in them and I'm writing Hellbound, but I'm writing that for you guys. Cause people on here were like, we'd be interested in reading that. And I was like, oh, someone's interested in reading my work. Okay. And you know, I've had opportunities to, to get bigger projects made, but I haven't taken them because it doesn't feel that's not where I'm at in my life. Like that fe would feel so weird. And that would put me back sort of in the limelight in a way I don't think I'm comfortable with anymore. Although I am thinking about doing the podcast. I'm having a lot of fun talking to you guys. Uh, what script am I most proud of? Probably deeper or higher. I think those, I think those are, I think they're as perfect as I can write. I wouldn't say they're perfect scripts, but I think they're as perfect as I can write. And I also think the first draft of American Ultra that had the beefier first act was really good. I think Bright's really good. Chronicle's really good. Victor Frankenstein, a movie that's not really good. I'm very proud of that script. Just because if it's very different than the film, the first draft of the script. It ends in the Wild West, to give you an idea of how different. Um, but it's much more of like a drama, an emotional drama, less of like a quirky action British thing. Oh yeah. Go to sleep. Wow. Do, do I seem, do I seem like I need to go to sleep? Because I feel like I need to go to sleep. Yeah. Mayweather. That was a good one. Would I ever leave LA? Not as long as all my friends and family are here. Like. I don't want to go be this guy somewhere else. Like, where is there for this guy? Austin, New York. I don't want to go back to New York, Vancouver, Portland, Berlin. Somewhere in Scotland, maybe there's supposed to be Edinburgh, the fringe festival. Where else could I do my weird bullshit? I'm in LA I can use my money I made from working hard and investing and I can make my weird, I can meet an animator and make an animated movie. I can rent sets and shoot a movie of just me talking. Where else in the world can I do that? Why would I ever leave? And then on the weekend I can drive out to see one of my best friends in Joshua Tree. And then I can come back into town and see my parents like, People always talk about leaving LA, but they don't understand. I'm from LA. I am LA. I'm the most LA person I know in the best way and the worst way. Like I, I feel like I am, I have the sort of manic grimy energy of this city emblazoned on my soul. And I've lived so many other places and they're just not as good. I was just talking about this. I went to pizza with my friend tonight and I had literally this conversation. Is this what my podcast is going to be is Come back to Connecticut. Uh, you're an Aussie? Uh, yes. Uh, you. I mean, the Australian film, I hear the film world is opening up. I am the most LA person. It is cringy. That is, that is cringy. You are correct. If you hear things I say and you're like, that's cringy, I want to let you know. You're right, but this I'm this is where it's at. Um, <laughs> this is who I am. Uh, I haven't tried to to go after any large projects or anything like that. Any chance of another RLM appearance? What is their content now? What is RLM's content? I stopped watching reviews of movies because I just found that well. Why did I stop watching reviews of movies? Watch the fucking cats video. Go watch the video where I do cats. Deputy Andy, what's your story? Are we going to fuck? What's your, what's your deal? Why are you still here? Who are you actually? 
you guys don't know. This could be this could be anybody. I have a lot of interesting uh, a lot of interesting characters wandering around in my life still. I glance over at the chat as though it's actually to my right. Speak up, son. Speak up, you little bitch. Is that how I should treat my trolls, or should I be kind? No, absolutely you couldn't. <laughs> absolutely you couldn't. You want to know why? Because then i know who you were. You play at your level. As though there's a level I play at. I'm an idiot. Have you watched this video? Someone who could play at your level. Please be serious. Please be serious. I'm an idiot. Play at my level? You think it's hard to make up good ideas for, like, movies? You just need to think about it a lot. And then it's fun and you think of lots of them. <laughs> Your little Dracula versus James Bond. You gonna try that and movie fights? Oh, movie fights. The good old days. Ah, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The American Werewolf homage in Army of the Dead. Oh, the American Werewolf homage. Kind of like the aliens homage. Kind of like all the other things in that movie that are directly from other movies. <clears throat> There's blood in my hand. Yeah, everyone should play Dreadnought. Everybody should get into Dreadnought. Dreadnought's the best game ever made. If you ever wanted to play a slow, slow game about spaceships. Good one. Okay, good night, everybody. I'm going to leave this up for a while. Uh, I don't think I said anything too stupid in this, you know, my favorite part in army of the dead, my favorite part in army of the dead is the part where that random girl, they're like, okay, I have two favorite parts in army of the dead. This is how we're going to end the night. We're going to do my two favorite parts of army of the dead. I'll be right back. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, Max Landis presents. My two favorite parts of Army of the Dead. Favorite part number one, the scene in which they're planning the heist is directly taken from Goldfinger. If you've seen 007 Goldfinger, you know the scene where the character Goldfinger has all the guys gathered and he's talking about the Fort Knox heist and he has the miniature of Fort Knox and he explains he's going to do this crazy thing, and the one guy leaves. And when he leaves, he goes out, and then he gets blown up, right? Like, gold, And then all the other guys go like, oh, I guess no one else can leave. Oh, he'll kill us if we don't do the heist, right? And they also do that in, like, Dr. Evil, I think, does that in Austin Powers to number one. He kills him. He kills the henchman. So this is seen in Army of the Dead where they do the Goldfinger thing, with the miniature, but it's kind of, they're kind of in an airplane hangar with all these cars parked. And of course it's Zack Snyder. So all the cars are in mint condition. Zack Snyder cars are either in mint condition as though they were custom designed for this moment and have just had the plaster peeled away, or they're like wrecky junks. And so these are mint condition, like primo convertibles. So they're very noticeable. That's the first part. And there's this little, statue of the hotel and they're like this is how you do the heist so one of the guys is a youtuber and he kills zombies on youtube and this is still the early part of army of the dead where it's like really good before it tries to be a zombie movie at the end and kind of goes nuts and you know becomes army of the dead but but so they're designing the heist right and the youtuber guy has brought these two people with him uh, one guy and a girl. And they go, who here has ever killed a zombie, never killed a zombie before? And the girl raises her hand. And the guy also raises his hand. And then he goes, this is what we're doing? Zombies? You didn't tell me that we were doing this. I'm going to leave. So already this makes no fucking sense. This guy's a YouTuber 
who's famous for killing zombies. The guy, the Japanese guy who's hiring them has said they're doing it in Las Vegas with zombies a hundred times in the 10 minute scene. And this guy's just been standing there like, and then he goes, zombies, I'm out of here. So like classic, right? Classic goon leaves the party and gets killed. So he goes and gets in, I believe a bright red convertible. I remember the car as being abnormally distracting. And he sits into it and starts it. And the sound design guy goes, oh, I'll do the engine noise. And then as pulling out. And then in real time, as the other characters continue talking, he backs out and then has to do like a three-point turn between to leave the warehouse. So the whole time I'm sitting there feeling like the educated film viewer back in a theater in Los Angeles, delighted, waiting for the Goldfinger thing. He just leaves. He doesn't blow up. But that means that means that the whole there's like 40 seconds of screen time of him in the background of every shot with loud car backing up and moving noises as he leaves. But it's not played as a joke. And that's the beauty of Zack Snyder is that it's so hard to tell when he's kidding because sometimes he's kidding and it's really funny but then other times it's funny and it's not because he's kidding and it's like that moment ties in to a later moment so remember the girl who raised her hand and is like i've never killed a zombie before so once the characters get into las vegas the movie kind of normalizes in a frustrating way because up until that point, Army of the Dead's fucking nuts. It's so fun. And then really right at this part, it kind of, well, it kind of goes bad when they arbitrarily kill off one of the characters very early on. But they, they end up in this situation where they're surrounded by like sleeping zombies. And the bad guy character, who has no character other than I'm bad, for no reason, for no reason, and he does it again later, fucks over a good guy. And he basically leaves her stranded in all these zombies. There is then a beautifully directed action sequence, like really a 10, like wonderful, of this girl fighting her way out of this situation. And it's intercut with the group leaving. And it's so well done because it keeps getting to the moment where you go, and now the zombie bite, and now the zombie bite. But Zack Snyder, God bless him, just goes, no, actually, this is the most badass girl in the whole world. And she's wearing the bandana like Vasquez, right? Now, Vasquez, for those not familiar with her, is a character from the film Aliens. She is a Latina who may or may not be gay or bisexual, perhaps, uh, who is one of the Marines, who has a deep friendship that is quickly established with another Marine named Frost and loses him and is sad about it and blames a corporal in the, the group for the death of her friend. And then ultimately becomes a very useful ally to Ripley and Hicks and Hudson and the gang, and then ultimately sacrifices herself, but in that moment learns to really respect the man who she had blamed for the death of her friend, and they share an intimate, if not romantic, moment before blowing up the aliens. Holy shit, James Cameron, are you a genius? Did you sneak an incredibly well-rounded story arc in for a character who has like 25 lines? James Cameron, is Aliens the best micro character writing of all time? The fact that we're able to get a sense of who all those Marines are, even the ones who like don't matter, like the black medic guy whose name I don't remember. I remember him well. Or, or Frost, whose name I only remember because he has white hair and he's Frost. No, Zack Snyder knows better. He knows the way to do it is to, this character's never killed a zombie. Then she kills a hundred zombies. But she... She... 
<laughs> she, uh, Vasquez, you're just too bad. Yeah, so, no, no, no. So here we go, guys. So she kills one million zombies, right? And then it's like, well, she's got to be dead now. And the dude polarizes her, burks her, just like aliens. Literally aliens. Literally Vasquez banging on the door going, I'm going to kill you, Burke. You little cocksucker, whatever she says. Like, literally, Zack Snyder just does the moment. Except for then, he ganglands it and does something totally unexpected. Which is when the guy comes out, the bad guy comes out, he says to the group, leave her, she's dead. And then this bitch comes crashing through the wall. Still no zombie bites. Still killing zombies. Now, you have to understand, at this point, she's maybe 11 feet from the characters. Zack Snyder's geography and cinematography in this movie is constantly in tights and closes in loose focus and intentionally blurred, which means oftentimes his geography gets a little messy, gets a little crazy. You can't tell where people are. Gets a little 300, but on a practical set where you're like, whoa, depth. Is that guy, can that guy hear what these people are saying? And it's like kind of dreamlike. I like the way a lot of Army of the Dead looks, honestly. I thought it was brave. I think we're entering the era of the freak filmmaker. Now, if only he could write a third act. Uh, but no, I shouldn't say that. Zack Snyder is a brilliant visual artist, and I put forward positivity on this channel. And I'm grateful for Zack Snyder being allowed to make something like that, honestly. Those pink opening credits. Madness. Just madness. Anyway, so Vasquez girl comes crashing through the wall, and she's right next to her friends. And she's killing lots of zombies, right? Killing lots of zombies. It's so cool, right? It's so cool. Because, like, wait a minute. Is this? So if this was me, in my head, my brain goes in writer mode. And I'm like, this is such a great way to backdoor a main character into a movie. Like, just have it be a random extra put in a familiar trope situation where we always see a character die and then subvert the trope so brutally by having her kill 100 zombies. What a great introduction for a character who lives till the end of the film, right? Like, what a great way to do it. Red Letter Media hated the use of the lenses? That does not surprise me. Mike and Jay, their tastes... They're not the same as mine. I I I love any movie that is trying. I've been involved in lots of movies and they're hard. And I love people being creative. And I really hate movies that I think are cynical. That was why I came at that first Star Wars so much. But I even regret doing that because it's not helpful because a lot of people loved it. So who am I, the Grinch? The Grinch of Star Wars? I'm going to be the Grinch of Army of the Dead? I'd rather be the Grinch of people being the Grinch, you know? Good writers, border made. Both. I think I think writing is, is a talent and a gift. But anyway, so, but also something you have to work at and make better. Let me fucking finish. Guys. So I will never speak about Sucker Punch publicly because I will never relive that pain. But no, I, uh, again, but I'm glad he was allowed to do it because holy shit, like, imagine a world where crazy women pretend they're hookers and hookers pretend they're samurai dressed like hookers. Sucker Punch. I'm Zack Snyder and I understand women. I thought it was cool. I mean, like, fuck it. Like, if you could, if I could make Sucker Punch, I might make Sucker Punch. If they gave me a zilly dollars to go crazy on my Kung Fu Girl movie, okay. Like, go for it. So, I thought it was weird that Tig... Nataro did a Krista Elia impression. And I also thought it was weird. It was just weird. Her the fate of her character was also like weird. Like 
that that was I really Tina Taro's first scene I really liked where she's on the other side of the fence and she goes I don't care don't tell me the risks I really thought her deadpan worked there but in the part where she's like I'm not the most important guy that sounded like her doing a Christy Ilia and it was like did cutting Christy Ilia out of this movie save it did removing Pepe Le Pew save Space Jam like good for you guys you did it like you guys see that the droogs are in the fucking, after I did that fucking, those two dumb videos about Pepe Le Pew, the fucking droogs from Clockwork Orange are front and center in the fucking trailer for Space Jam. Okay, so the Vasquez girl. The Vasquez girl. Imagine talking to a stripper and that is her headspace. Like the stripper sits down at the table with you and you make eye contact with her and you look into her eyes and she's like firing a machine gun at robot zombies. I know that stripper. Her name is Malice McMunn. Follow her on Instagram. She's a fucking trip and she's a cool chick. I'm like pimping Malice's Instagram. Let me tell you about this. Chick I know who's a stripper where you look in your eyes, you see machine guns being fired at zombies. Uh, but no, so that's Kes girl comes crashing to the ground right in front, right in front of the fucking group. And the guy goes, leave her. And she stands up and kills 10 more zombies. And they're standing right there. And then slowly, 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 she is attacked and eaten by zombies and she gets blown up. But like, then there's this giant explosion that comes right at the camera. But then the characters are so clearly, everyone is so clearly not in the same physical space. And it's been green screened or something. And so it seems like a bunch of people stand right next to this girl as she's eaten by zombies and then explode her, but the explosion doesn't affect them. And those are my two favorite parts of Land of the Dead. Uh, <laughs> what do I think about the robot zombies and the robot alien baby in the time loop? I think executives in the studio system used to give notes because creative people would have an overabundance of ideas occasionally, right? So executives were put in a position to give notes to sort of hem a movie, right? But then the 80s came around, the era of blockbusters, and executives at studios were given more and more power. Suddenly, directors found themselves notoriously butting heads with studio executives again and again and again while they trying to change the picture. And this went up and down. You know, there was a rise of auteur filmmakers in the 70s and independent film. But then by the 90s, the executives had a weird amount of power. Film had gone corporate and everything was getting a little weird creatively. The Weinsteins did this brilliant thing where they basically took indie, rest their souls, they're dead, R.I.P., don't rest their souls, torture them in hell. But they uh, did this brilliant thing where they basically brought all these directors into the mainstream. And so suddenly the studio filmmaking architecture was about controlling a project. And that meant a lot of working with screenwriters and it became about the script. So for the mid nineties was the golden era of screenwriting and screenwriters such as Shane Black, my old friend, and a number of others got big ass checks to write weird ass movies because they were buddies with the execs and buddies with the producers. So here we go. Moving into the 2000s, they were realizing it's going to be about brands. The movies had an eye on the future, and you can actually see this almost immediately rising in the sequels to The Matrix, the sequels to Pirates of the Caribbean, the sequels to the Star Wars prequels, this Lord of the Rings. They're trying to like build empires because they're scared because what are movies doing making less and less and less and less money so they're all panicking and executives start to get lots and lots of power then things get weird in the 2000s like dead ass weird because executives now have the power to like 
change the endings to movies. Most of these execs are not even people who necessarily wanted ever to work in film. They're not people who have passion. They're someone's friend or they worked in marketing or they were an agent for a long time or they this or they're a producer or that. Usually not a producer. Usually they were like someone who studied business and now they're giving creative notes. They're giving notes on movies they wouldn't watch. Suddenly studio movies are increasingly thought of as these like derivative pieces of trash. Things like Van Helsing that have been noted to death come out and they fucking face plant. And you know what happens? The studios get even more scared. And suddenly only the old guard directors have freedom in their movies and even they start to have trouble with the studios. The studio stops wanting to hire people like Joe Dante, John Carpenter, work hand directors from the 90s who were legendary iconic directors from their cult films in the 80s at this point, but they wanted too much control. What was the new model? Hire young directors, hire people they could bully, hire screenwriters and then fire them, replace them, change the script, do anything you want. It was a nightmare. It was a horrifying, horrifying, horrifying situation. But then came the streaming boom. It started with Netflix. And Netflix's sort of idea was we are not a film company. We are a content company. Why would we give you creative notes? Now, you've seen Netflix movies. They're like that because they are the auteur, the most important person on the project, the person who got the biggest check, has total creative control. The Netflix, so so what you're seeing is Zack Snyder with near total artistic freedom. David Ayer with near total artistic freedom. Like, you look at Suicide Squad, that's a movie that probably would have been like Bright, but instead is like it how it is because it's studio trying to change it. And, you know, I worked with these people. A lot of studio executives and producers and stuff are smart, are cool. I've gotten notes. Ma majority of notes I've gotten have been, if not smart, at least in the direction of smart, right? And they always, you always, notes almost always taste like this, right? But you have to smile and drink it because that's your job. That's what you get paid is to change your idea. Having an idea a monkey can do, you know, changing your idea to the way that everybody agrees it's good. That's the skill. And what's really funny is that like the new model of like creator driven, like what I'm doing on my YouTube channel, this bizarre Superman stuff, I'm aware that it's indulgent and bizarre, but I have the same level of creative freedom in it that Zach does on Zach, my old friend, Zach, but Zach Snyder, uh, director of the brilliant Watchmen and the fantastic Dawn of the Dead remake, um, that he uh, he has. And I think everyone's going to start seeking that freedom. And I think what could happen, we might be entering, I think we're entering the era of the freak filmmaker because I think studios are really going to get desperate soon and are going to start taking weird risks like on weird people just combining name brands with brands. They're already doing that a little bit with like taking Taika and making him the Thor guy. Like they've sort of been doing that a little bit. Like, like what if there's a Wes Anderson brand movie, you know, how much money would they pay Wes Anderson? You know, j j just to try, I'm not saying that that's necessarily where it'll go, but it does feel like creator driven content is what's breaking through everywhere, but in the mainstream, right? Wow, that was, wait, you guys are talking about the angry video game nerd? What do you mean what's going on with me in Red, Red Letter Media? Why do people think stuff is going on? I am not aware of anything negative ever of me and Mike. Jay didn't like me that much, but he didn't hate me. It was just like, I was nervous to be around them and hyped up. Me and Rich, uh, laughed harder than I've maybe ever laughed. And we all actually had like a great time. Like the double down, the podcast part of it was like actually really fun because by then I'd like calm down. I was less obnoxious and you can see we're having fun and it's funny. Um, but Mike and I kept in contact. I got him into the magic castle, I think. And you know, there are guys I kind of very loosely barely know. And like people always ask me like, what's going on with you and Jenny Nicholson? I like, 
kind of knew Jenny Nicholson for a while. She's cool. That's like, I don't have any, I always feel bad that I don't have like drama. Well, if they remove my video, that makes sense. They don't want to get fucking harassed. I'm not, I don't hold that against them. Jay is the most handsome of RLM. Rich is the most handsome of RLM. Jesus Christ. Lindsay Ellis. I, I, eh, I don't enjoy her content. I feel bad because people have always been like, Lindsay Ellis, Lindsay Ellis. But I, I, I feel bad about it because I never got – I like some of ContraPoints. That's the one people always recommend to me. And I like some of Lindsay Ellis. But that's not really the type of content – the sort of more literary quality of her critiques of things isn't interesting to me. And I saw her bright video and you know, everything she says about the movie bright is right. But I wish she had like read the script or something. Cause it's like a failure of world building. That's why, I, that's how I sold my script was on the world building. Uh, but then he cut it all out. So yeah, like I'm never going to complain about a bad review again. I've made too many movies now. When American Ultra came out, I could still get my feelings hurt by a bad review. Now, now that just feels like way in the past. Oh yeah. Is that Janeway says the problems with uh, Lindsay Ellis is that she assumes she's smart and assumes she's always right. And her content is great. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's my problem with her. Um, Ariana just got married, I saw. Anyway, I'm going to go to sleep. Oh, my God. Yeah, Nick Robinson is really great. If I could, rec I could recommend, I should do a, a YouTube video where I recommend all my favorite YouTubers. Uh, yeah, no, uh, Lindsay, it's interesting. When she made the when she made the Bright video, I was like loosely knew her through Jenny Nicholson. And she was like, no hard feelings, kid. Nothing personal, kid. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. I, uh, I'm going to leave this up for a minute. This is me trying out my podcast. And I'm going to call it Max Landis does a podcast stone, but then gets steadily less stone throughout the podcast and talks about 400 different things like Jesus Christ. What a journey. Jenny Nicholson is not cringe. Jenny Nicholson is class. You're cringe.